In this video, I'm going to discuss the basics of symbolization, the what symbolization is, what its basic principles are. In following videos, I'm going to discuss some difficulties that arise in doing symbolization and also how to use the symbolization module in the program. And in that latter video, I'll do a bunch of examples as well. So what's the goal of symbolization? So uh, basically, we're translating from English into logic. I'll sometimes refer to the logical language as L. So the point is we want to find sentences, uh, if we have a sentence of English, we want to find a sentence of L that has the same form as the original English sentence. And that process is called symbolization. We're going from our, we're going from natural language English into a symbolic language L, and so that's why it's called symbolization. One of our ultimate go we're interested in the logical properties of English sentences, and since the logical properties of sentences of L are very obvious, if we can find sentences, or more obvious than they are of English anyway, and so if we can find symbols of L, or sentences of L that symbolize the sentences of English, then we have a better grip on the logical properties of the original sentences of English. So what are basic symbolization principles? Well, so the first principle is this. A sentence letter of the logical language can mean anything, as long as it's a proposition or a claim, something that's true or false. And so a sentence letter of English can symbolize any English sentence at all. So the sentence, if Opus can read, Opus is happy, um, that can be symbolized by a letter. So that could be symbolized by P. But it's not a good symbolization. That would be a bad symbolization. Our goal is to capture the English, the logical form of the English sentences. And so we don't want to symbolize complex English sentences by sentence letters because the complex English sentence has a logical form, but the sentence letter doesn't. If it's a conditional in English, we should get a, we should produce a conditional in the logical language as well. We should symbolize English conditionals by logical conditionals. So if we have opus can read only if opus went to school, we should not symbolize that as P. That's a bad symbolization. We want to symbolize that as a conditional, as it is. So English atomic sentences should be symbolized by sentence letters. An atomic sentence is a sentence that doesn't have any sentences as parts or as constituents. So it's a sentence, it's going to have parts. Opus can read is a sentence and it has the parts opus can and read. But there are no sentences that are part of it. So that makes it an atomic sentence. If a, a non-atomic sentence, a complex sentence, that should be symbolized by a complex logical sentence. So simple English, simple logic, or atomic English, atomic logic, complex English, complex logic, when you're symbolizing. So, okay, and the sort of basic obvious principles are these. If we have a sentence in English that it is not the case that blah, 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 we should symbolize that as not blah, 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 or not, uh, uh, not and then a symbolization of blah, blah, blah. And if we have, if blah, 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 then blah, 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 then we should have an arrow and the antecedent before the arrow should symbolize the English antecedent and the sub, the sentence of logic that comes after the conditional should symbolize the English consequent. Now for each complex English sentence we'll have what we call a scheme of abbreviation and what that does is says for each of the atomic English sentences here's the sentence letter that we're going to symbolize that atomic English sentence with and then using that scheme of abbreviation, we then symbolize the whole of the English sentence. So let's look at, oh well, before we get to an example of this, I want to tell you about the symbolization examples document. So this is available through the program. You can find it if you go into the symbolization module. There's a button on the bottom that says examples, and if you push it, it will open up the symbolization examples document. And it's also online at, on our course website, and in particular, I've posted it below this video, so you can get it right there. And it gives you a whole bunch of the, sort of it spells out principles for symbolization, and then it provides a lots of good examples that are worked through. So it's a really useful resource to use when you're symbolizing beyond what the text itself has. So I would like you to read that in addition to reading the sections of the text on symbolization. So let's look at some simple examples. So we have the case, it is not the case that uh, ISA is a Democrat. How do we symbolize that? Well, we could symbolize that as not P, where P, 
the sentence letter symbolizes Isa is a Democrat. And, right, so we have negation of Isa is a Democrat, so we translate Isa is a Democrat into P, and then we put a negation on the front of that. We have, if Opus can read, then Opus is happy. Well, we can symbolize that as P arrow Q, given the appropriate scheme. So the scheme is P symbolizes Opus can read, and Q symbolizes Opus is happy. So we're using our scheme of abbreviation, which uh, pairs each English atomic sentence with a sentence letter to produce the symbolizations of the complex sentences. So I'm going to get into more involved symbolization in the second video. Right now I want to say a little bit about the conditional in English. The conditional, natural language conditionals are, uh, turn out to be very complicated uh, to explain how they work. I'm going to make a couple of points about that now and I'll make some more later when we get to chapter 2. So consider the conditional if square then circle, where square is some English sentence and circle is some English sentence. So you might wonder, suppose that's true. Suppose it's true that if square, then circle. Does it follow that square caused circle? Does if square, then circle mean that square caused circle? Does it mean that square came before circle? Well, we can certainly come up with examples where if square, then circle is true and also square caused circle and square came before circle. So I say, if I exercise regularly, then my fitness will improve. Okay, so the regular exercising causes the fitness improve causes the fitness improvement. So the antecedents being true causes the consequence being true. We have two different states of affairs. One makes the other happen. There, there's my working out. There's my being fit, and the one causes the other. And the working out proceeds in time comes before the fitness improvement. I mean, they're staggered, right? But so sometimes when a conditional is true, in fact, yes, the antecedent comes before in time, precedes, is earlier than the consequent, and the antecedent causes the consequent. But that's not always the case. While it's sometimes the case, this, that's not what the conditional means, and the conditional can be true without the antecedent causing the consequent. So let's have some examples of that. If dolphins are mammals, then some sea life is mammalian. Um, there's no real temporal relation here. Uh, there's no sort of first dolphins were mammals and then some sea life was mammals. No, it's um, it, if there's a time at which there are dolphins and they're mammals, then there's also a time at which there's some mammalian sea life. And they're not really clearly set very sort of distinct states of affairs. So it doesn't look like there's any causal relation going on here and or any sort of antecedent being true before the consequence being true. So here, it's not even clear that it makes sense to talk about causation and temporal relations, time relations, relations of time. How about if there is now life on Earth, evolution occurred? What if this is true? As I believe, but in any case, if it's true, well, in this case, what makes the consequent true would come before what makes the antecedent true. Because we're talking about what's, if there's now life on Earth, then earlier there was evolution, right? So uh, evolution occurred in the past. And if, any, if there's any causal relationship, it's that the evolution caused there to now be life on Earth, or at least part of the cause of there now being life on Earth. So in this case, we have what makes the consequent true, both preceding and causing what makes the antecedent true. Another example, if Brown is governor, Brown was elected. Same thing. Uh, first he was elected, and as a result, he became governor. So the consequent is causing the antecedent, and the consequent is coming in time. What's making the consequent true comes before what makes true the antecedent. So these cases show that while... When, it, when we have a true conditional if square caused circle, it might be that, sorry, misspoke. If we have a true conditional if square then circle, uh, it might be that square caused circle, and it might, that, that is the antecedent caused the consequent, and it might be that the antecedent is, when what makes the antecedent true comes before what makes the consequent true, but it doesn't have to be that way. And the conditional doesn't mean that those things are, are the case. You can say them, they're perfectly good things to say when they're true, but that's not what the conditional says. So that's what I have to say about symbols of 
principles of symbolization. In the next video, we'll have discussion of some difficulties that arise in doing symbolizations. And then finally, in the final video, we'll have some examples of symbolization done in the symbolization module and showing how to use the symbolization module.